High school creep verbally assaults my BFF for rejecting him, so I expose his messages to the entire school and get him suspended. Here's what happened. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube and hit the bell for notifications. This story happened when I was in high school. I went to a smallish high school, around 950 students ranging from the 9th to 12th grade. With so many students in one place, I had quite a few good friends that I talked to, but only a handful that I hung out with and talked with on a daily basis. Now, there was a certain person in our social group. Let's call him Bailey. Bailey was a social outcast by many people's standards, not by bullying or hazing or mistreatment from the other students. It's just that no one really liked him because he was a jerk all the time. He was always playing the victim when he was rejected by girls. He even threatened to ruin the lives of said girls who did reject him. He harassed girls online and touched them in uncomfortable places in person after being told to stop. Stomach, lower back, neck, things like that. He begged for money from people. He was a sexist and racist person to all races and ethnicities. He put himself into other people's conversations and generally wasn't a very nice person to hang around. I have a really good friend. Let's call her A. A has been my best friend ever since I can remember, and she's a wonderful, sweet, and generous person to everyone. One day, we got out for winter break. A came up to me in the hallway before the end of school, bawling her eyes out. I asked her to tell me what was wrong, and she said that Bailey had asked her out before she went to her class over text. But when she declined after explaining that she already had a boyfriend, all hell broke loose. He called her an N-word slut and said she should kill herself because of how fat she was. He said no one loved her because she was a mixture of the two worst races and said that no one would want her because she's a C-word and said she had a stinky woohoo area. A had some insecurities about herself and Bailey hit every single one of them point blank. I was seething with rage while reading her texts, and I was completely appalled and disgusted at his behavior. I told her to dry her eyes and send me screenshots of the conversation he had with her. When she asked what I was going to do with them, I simply told her that I'd had enough of him harassing girls, and I was going to do something about it. Now, I wasn't going to confront him directly, not with how angry I was at the moment. Instead, I decided to rally the troops and get ready for the bloodbath. I was going to massacre what was left of his entire high school career, his entire life. Now, Bailey had done this to girls before, and luckily, I had those girls' numbers saved in my phone because they were my friends and would send each other memes. So, I made a group chat and asked everyone to send any type of rude, racist, sexist, or failed attempt to be asked out screenshot over any type of social media that Bailey had sent to them. Over the next 15 minutes, my phone was blaring with text notifications. There were screenshots of Snapchat stories, Facebook comments, text messages. All in all, I had around 60 photos of sexist, racist, or unsolicited pictures or jerk comments or rants that he had made to 15 females, including myself. Over winter break, I composed all of those screenshots into a nice little PowerPoint and saved it in my flash drive on my laptop. I spoke with our principal and I asked him if I could show him something relevant to the safety of the student body during his free break at lunch. He told me that he had no problem with it and a time was set. When it finally comes time for my meeting with the principal, I have a small parade of girls behind me who wanted to come testify, anxiously holding on to each other's hands. We were invited into the principal's private conference room as he sets up his laptop and plugs my flash drive in to connect it to the projector. The principal called in some teachers to be witnesses and called Bailey down to the conference room to take a seat and try to defend himself if the allegations weren't true. The principal clicks the remote to play my presentation, and it slowly begins to load up. The first slide comes up and the room goes deathly silent, with a few gasps of shock. As the slides continue on, I notice Bailey is squirming around in his seat, clearly uncomfortable, and the people in the room are getting more agitated and angry. Halfway through the slides, Bailey jumps to his feet and throws his arms in front of the projector screen to censor out a particular image that he had sent to a girl, even though she had blurted out. He tried to explain that he was joking with the comments about race and being a guy or girl, and that these girls were framing him for something he didn't do. He pointed to me and said that I was the ringleader of this operation and that I should be the one who was thrown on the spot, not him. 
The entire room was tense, and the principal turned on the lights with his hands on his hips and let out a giant sigh. The principal turns to me and tells me thank you for bringing this to his attention, and he asks if he could take the flash drive and use it for the investigations and alleged rumors that were going on about Bailey. I gave it to him, and he thanked me again before he left with Bailey and the teachers in tow. Since I copied the original slideshow to my flash drive, I sent the PowerPoint to not only mutual friends at the school, but also his mom and dad through Facebook. All of them were not only absolutely disgusted by his comments, but his family was extremely distraught, but thankful I brought this up to their attention. A few days later, the entire school was summoned to the gym for an announcement. Bailey was there with his parents on either side of him and his frail grandma on the small stage we have set up for concerts and band productions. It turns out the parents, mainly the grandma, wanted it to be known that there are consequences for your actions. And since the grandma was head of the household, she called the principal and requested an assembly to address her grandson's behavior. The slideshow is playing on repeat on a projector in the background for everyone to see. The principal said a few words about how harassment in any shape, form, or fashion would not be tolerated, and neither would sexism or any form of racist behavior or comments. The principal made Bailey apologize publicly to the school about his behavior, and how he would never do it again. His parents were embarrassed, but they also apologized to the school and to the young ladies that he had harassed. His grandmother did not let him off so easily. She slapped his knee with her cane hard and started yelling at him for being so disgusting and such a disappointment to her and to the rest of the family. Bailey started to cry on the stage as his mother and father tried to calm down his grandmother. Once everything calmed down, they were escorted off the property. He was suspended for the rest of the year for verbal harassment and racist comments. Later on in the same year, I found out that he had tried to rob a grocery store and was now facing trial for battery, assault with a deadly weapon, and armed robbery. My friends and I all graduated happily and I never saw that jerk again. I don't understand how there are people that exist in the world that think this type of behavior is in any way acceptable. Normally, I would start looking at the parents, but it sounds like he's actually got some people looking over him that want him to be a decent person. So I really don't know what went wrong here, honestly. But either way, the pattern of behavior that he's developed is absolutely disgusting. I don't need to sit here and tell you that these things are not okay to say. Honestly, stories like this just make me angry more than anything. There's nothing to really be said here. This behavior is wrong, and it cannot be allowed, period. Grandma seems to have the right idea. Maybe a couple more whacks with that cane will get him in line. I really do hope they censored parts of that presentation for the General Assembly, though. Entitled Karen that I babysit for yells at my mom because I ate two cookies while I was at her house. So I make sure to get back at her in the best way possible. When I was in my teens, I had a paper route, mowed lawns, that sort of thing, for extra money. I also babysat. One of my paper route customers wanted a babysitter for a Saturday night, and I took the gig. They wanted me there for 7 p.m., and I was 10 minutes early. The wife kept an immaculate home. Everything in its place and very tidy. When I arrived, she gave me the rundown, including pointing out how she had graciously provided me a snack, two Oreo cookies, and a glass of juice on the counter. I had skipped dinner, and soon after they left, I explored the pantry, found the bag of Oreos, and helped myself to two more. Now, this pantry was the size of a large walk-in closet, and it was stuffed. There were lots of canned goods, all facing forward with the labels in perfect alignment. There were cereal boxes set up on the shelves in descending sizes. I don't know if she was a 1970s version of a doomsday prepper, but there was a ton of stockpiled food in there. All went well until they returned. The wife said she was paying me from 8pm, even though I arrived before 7, because they were late leaving. She also made a point of magnanimously pointing out that the hubby was giving me a free ride home. Lady, it's after midnight and I'm 15. Did you expect me to walk home? Whatever. Then the storm hit. The next day, she shows up at our house, freaking out on my mom, calling her a lousy parent and me a thief. Why? Because I ate those two cookies. That's right. She counted the Oreos and found two missing. 
The argument was short. My mom told her to screw off and she roared away down the street. Fast forward a month or two and I'm delivering the Saturday paper in the early afternoon and hubby asks if I'm available to babysit that evening. Apparently, the babysitter they had arranged backed out at the last minute. Against my better judgment, I accepted. I could use the cash. The wife made a point of mentioning that she didn't want a repeat of last time, and made me agree not to eat anything but what she had laid out for me. Fine. I didn't know at the time, but it's clear the wife suffered from OCD. If I had known, I probably wouldn't have done what I did. I have a little more knowledge about psychological conditions now, but at the time, all I knew was that this woman was a jerk who had yelled at my mom. So as soon as they left, I got to work. I removed every label from every can in the pantry. She had them all set up by categories, soups on one shelf, canned fruit on another, canned vegetables on a different shelf. I scattered them. I also shuffled the boxes around. I messed that pantry up any way I could. I pulled out the tray from the Chips Ahoy cookies and put them in the Oreos bag and then put the Oreos in the Chips Ahoy bag. I pulled out the bag from the Rice Krispies box and swapped it with the cornflakes. You get the idea. Then I left a note on the floor that said, don't ever call me again. They paid me when they got home and I said I would walk home. I then took the money they gave me and left it in their mailbox on the way out. The next morning, I gave my parents a heads up about what I had done, just in case Psycho Wife showed up again. They were disappointed, but quite amused. She never showed up. I continued the paper route for some time, but within a few days, I had received notice that they had canceled their delivery of the newspaper. Fine with me. Over the next few months, I would see them now and again and would simply look at them and smile. They would scramble back into the house, avoiding me. There were also some kids on my route that had some experience with this woman, and apparently she had treated others badly as well. That was the reason she couldn't find a sitter. Word had gotten around to avoid that jerk. When I told one or two what I had done, they all thought it was brilliant and wished they had thought of it. I agree that it definitely sounds like she had OCD. Her behavior kind of indicates that, between counting of cookies and being that upset that two are missing, along with all the labels being in perfect alignment in the pantry, all of that shouts obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, you did address that and say that you didn't understand that kind of thing at the time, which I get, but I'm sure hubby in this story had to deal with a heck of a lot for the next couple days. I do gotta give you points for creativity on how you managed to screw with her though. I can't say I would've had the patience to be that thorough. Rich jerk constantly screws with my friend, so my friend gets him sent off to military school. This happened to my friend G back in the 1960s. He was 14 to 15 years old in high school in a small west coast town in the USA. G was a small, easygoing kid. He did some work cutting lawns or something for his rich jerk neighbor of the same age. And of course, rich jerk stiffed him. G's parents complained to Rich Jerk's parents who couldn't believe their perfect little son would ever do such a thing. There were a couple of other incidents, mostly Rich Jerk stealing credit at school for work G had done, or general bullying. But Rich Jerk was a suck up as well as a weasel, and nothing ever happened. He wasn't even suspected. Key point, Rich Jerk had an electric typewriter, which was rare in my high school days, and bragged about it and showed off his efforts. He claimed to get better grades on typed paper. G saw an opportunity here. Like most of the houses in town in that bygone era, security was minimal. It was easy to slip in an unlocked window. So that's what G did when the house was empty. He brought a little file with him and filed a little off the bar of the E character on the typewriter, just enough to make it unique. Then he very slowly typed up a page. G didn't type, so it was hunt and peck. The page started with, ha ha, the stupid teacher never reads this far, he's a real jerk face, and continued for a full page. It used every dirty word he could think of, and especially insulted the vice president in charge of the teachers. He then left with this piece of paper, leaving everything else untouched. Several weeks later, Rich Jerk had typed another paper. It was paper clipped together as per the requirements. G somehow managed to distract either him or the teacher and slid his special sheet in the middle. Rich Jerk failed the class, even though he'd been getting good grades up to that point. He appealed to the vice president. The extra insults directed the VP's way made the VP allow the teacher's grade. 
Rich Jerk claimed that someone else must have typed that, but upon closer examination, the modified E character matched on all the pages and didn't match any other typewriter. Checkmate. His own parents didn't believe him. Once they started looking, they found a lot more bad behavior that they'd ignored, and Rich Jerk ended up in military school, not the place you want to be in the 1960s. While I doubt it was your intention to get him shipped off to military school, you can't argue with the results on this one. I don't blame our original poster for what happened. It seemed like it all just kind of snowballed from that initial incident that they kicked off. But it seems that this jerk of a kid had it coming. At least this way, our original poster's friend was free to not have to deal with this jerk anymore. My school cafeteria was serving food that was just unedible. So I had to do something about it. Back in my college days, I lived on campus and ate the 20 meals a week meal plan at the cafeteria. It was terrible, seriously. I know people complain about their college cafeteria all the time, but they still gain their freshman 15. I lost mine. The food was disgusting. Sunday spaghetti was made from tomato sauce and Saturday's cheap hamburgers. One week, they didn't bother ripping up the hamburgers. Watery, sauce-tinted, overcooked noodles garnished with dry, leathery, two-day-old hamburger patties. It was still better than the other options. At first, they had a make-your-own pizza line, but removed it because everyone was using it and apparently bread isn't cheap. I remember seeing a real salad in their Healthy Eats line and getting excited because it's hard to screw up salads, only to realize it was literally floating in oil. The salad on the actual salad bar was not an option. It was changed out every morning, whether it needed it or not. Oh, sorry, I meant the ice in the salad bar, not the salad, no. A student wrote his initials in the tuna and it remained there for a solid week. Sometimes the salad would grow its own salad. They had a big board set up for student complaints and they would write responses back. Oddly enough, the board rarely had bad things to say. The manager, may he be haunted by a thousand bedbugs, confessed that he didn't have the time to answer every complaint. But he did read every one and took the complaints into consideration. And from there, as far as we could tell, he would proceed to throw away all the ones he didn't like. At one point, the board of trustees wanted to meet with students. Only a handful of students, but I got my name on the list. The food was catered by the cafeteria. Basic sandwiches, if I recall. Still, the first step of any revenge is to make a big deal out of it. And boy, did I. Man, this sandwich has real lettuce on it. This is way better than what the cafeteria usually serves us. And the meat doesn't even have a rind on it. The trustees laughed it off. Surely it wasn't that bad, right? I didn't even have to answer. The other students filled in the details. Forcefully. For the rest of the meeting. It was supposed to be about general issues, but it became yell about the food situation. And was awesome. The administration, with the trustees yanking on their ear, had a talk with the cafeteria manager. And thus, Steak and Shrimp Night was born. It was touted as a really big deal, where they were going all out with super awesome food. Both the administration and the cafeteria promised great things. The students almost believed them. They made such a big deal out of it. The doors opened and someone was there handing out tickets. One ticket each. You could use it to get either a steak or some shrimp. A leathery, overcooked, gristly, thin, tiny steak or micro-sized, overcooked popcorn shrimp. Students left to eat ramen in their dorms in droves. People were angry. Students flooded the comment box with so many comments, the top actually broke off from the interior pressure. And the next day, the comment board had a single note on it, thanking the staff for the delicious meal. Now, the organization that ran the cafeteria was run by corrupt, money-grubbing jerks. But they were based out of state and super cheap, so there was no way we could touch them. Plus, a lot of employees were actually really nice people. It was the manager and his ogre, I mean wife, that were the problem. There was no way to fix it, until survey day, a few weeks before the end of the semester. Desperate for more than six entries total, the cafeteria was giving away a bike. Anyone who filled out a survey was entered for a chance to win. Not that anyone cared. The students had been ignored so long, they assumed the bike would be won by the manager, and having their name attached to the survey was extra super bad. I, however, hatched a plan. 
The poor lady handing out surveys was not allowed to do anything else that day. She was the survey lady, end of story, and she was supposed to stay until the last survey was handed out. I offered to pass out some surveys, and she gladly accepted. I took a stack of surveys to a back table and filled in every single one of them. Name, phone number, bad, zero, terrible, would not buy again, on to the next. Fun fact, the top of the survey with my name was designed to tear off. The name went in the bowl for the bike drawing, and the survey was submitted suddenly anonymously. I filled out a stack, returned them, then filled out another, and kept coming back until I filled out the very last survey she had. Revenge isn't for quitters. As I walked back to my dorm, my hand was sore, but my heart was light, and so began the falling dominoes. I didn't learn the full story until the next semester, but as it turned out, the survey was the worst on record. Administration, who had been watching closely, noticed. Angry meetings were had. Meetings that the cafeteria didn't cater. The health inspector was invited and gleefully slapped some hefty fines on the parent company. School cafeteria fines are no laughing matter, it seems. By the end of the semester, the manager was collecting his last paycheck. His wife was fired, too. Probably because she was a troll. Seriously, I'm pretty sure she lived under a bridge and bullied goats. The university got a sweet new please don't tell anyone deal. And oh man, the food. It tasted like food. Glorious day. Oh, and just to add insult to injury, I won the bike too. I'm sure everyone on campus was touting you as a hero that day. Cafeteria food is infamously horrible. Having to live off of it is not a pleasant experience for anyone that has to. But you know what? One way or another, this needed to happen. Clearly, they had become complacent in their routine of serving bad food, and it would take something big like this to actually shake up the system at this point. You probably could have saved yourself a lot of time and effort by just making a call to the health inspector, though. If it's as bad as you were describing from what you see, I can only imagine how bad it was behind the counter. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories, linked at the top of the description. And if you like Am I the Jerk, give Am I the Genius a shot, linked in the description as well. Either way, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.